Passive ventilation is often a topic of discussion in architecture firms and green building circles. In theory, it sounds great. In practice, it can create massive moisture and mold problems if you don't know what you're doing. In this video, we're going to share a mold remediation project that we were hired to consult on, why the building failed, and what we're doing to remediate these problems. Let's get into it. Japan is renowned for its traditional architecture. Modern Japanese homes and buildings are renowned for their mold problems. Traditional Japanese homes and buildings were primarily constructed of wood and paper, natural plasters, clay, wattle and daub, and stone. These are all highly breathable materials, meaning that vapor can pass through the material via diffusion relatively unrestricted. This is one of the ways that buildings dry out when they get wet. These buildings also had an immense amount of intentional passive ventilation throughout the entire building, which helped to facilitate the drying process by promoting air circulation and preventing moist air from stagnating. Many older Japanese homes and buildings were also constructed on post and beam floor systems that were left open to the exterior environment to dry out the wood flooring systems. Older homes in the deep south also took a similar approach. Mold growth and rot still happened, but the lack of insulation, the abundant airflow, heat flow, and absence of air conditioning provided a lot of redundancy. This approach does not work when we introduce air conditioning. We were approached by a client who was experiencing very severe mold problems in their new home in Okinawa, in the south of Japan. Okinawa is as hot and humid as Miami, Florida, so basically it's the equivalent of IECC climate zones 1A or 2A. By the time the client reached out to us, they had already undergone three different mold remediations. One mold remediation is a lot for any building, let alone for new construction. Three within a five to six year timeline is pretty much unheard of. The house was uninsulated and constructed of cast in place concrete walls with direct applied stucco and an interior furred cavity with drywall. The roof was also uninsulated and constructed of cast in place concrete with a tapered screed along with a reinforced polyurethane liquid applied membrane with a suspended ceiling system below. Now on the surface, there's nothing that would immediately ring any alarm bells unless there were some missing flashings. The lack of insulation, in theory, should allow these assemblies to dry out very easily if they ever got wet. What about the foundation system? It was a vented crawl space with a rat slab and an uninsulated framed floor above. There were severe condensation issues in these framed floor areas. This, on the other hand, is a really good indicator of what's happening here. Condensation indicates that we have hot, humid air leaking inside from an uncontrolled location and coming into contact with a cool surface that's at or below dew point. Remember, this is in Okinawa. Very hot, very humid, and right next to the ocean. It's not uncommon for outdoor temperatures to be between 85 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit at 80% relative humidity. That places our dew point temperature at around 78 degrees. If you're air conditioning the interior space, chances are you're going to be running that system anywhere between 68 to 76 degrees, which is several degrees below the dew point, and the unit itself will be running below that temperature in order to distribute the cold air. Wood also absorbs moisture as relative humidity increases, far before condensation starts forming on that surface. Mold growth can occur at around 60% relative humidity, or when wood exceeds 20% moisture content. Condensation in these hot, humid climates often forms on the ductwork that's transporting cold air and any other thermally conductive components. So that explains the condensation, the rust on the suspended ceiling components, and the mold on the backside of the drywall. But where is the warm, humid air coming from? You know how we mentioned earlier that traditional Japanese homes and buildings utilized a lot of passive ventilation? Well, that old building practice has been carried over to modern buildings. It's not uncommon in Japan for many new homes to implement passive vents right through the building enclosure and into the conditioned space without any environmental separation. The problem with passive ventilation is that we can't control the temperature, the humidity, or the quality of the incoming air, and oftentimes we need environmental separation between the inside and the outside, whether it's due to air pollutants, high temperatures, or high humidity. Warm air can carry a lot more moisture than cold air, and in a place like Okinawa, you're constantly inundated by hot, humid air due to the proximity of the ocean. These spherical forms are not exterior sconce lights, they're screened passive vents that terminate into the wall cavities and into the framed floor systems. Literal holes in the building. A direct path for warm, moisture-laden air to condense on the underside of the subfloor and on the back side of the interior finish materials, as these materials are located within the air-conditioned space. No air barrier separating the inside from the outside. It gets worse, though. 
The home had exhaust-only mechanical ventilation, that being kitchen exhaust, bathroom exhaust fans, and any other appliances that suck air out of the building, placing the home under negative pressure. These condensation issues are accelerated and significantly worsened by operating under a negative pressure environment because the outgoing air through the exhaust systems causes more warm, humid outside air to be sucked inside to replace the exhausted air to establish equilibrium. The clients would run their exhaust fans frequently to try to help circulate the air and to avoid stagnation, but this only exacerbated the problem as it didn't address the primary issue, which was that the passive vents were letting in hot, humid air within the wall and floor assemblies in combination with the air conditioning that they were running, which increased interior relative humidity. Believe it or not, there was another big problem. They had vinyl wallpaper installed on the exterior walls, which is a very strong vapor barrier located on the wrong side of the assembly, essentially trapping moisture within the cavity space and preventing it from drying to the interior. In hot, humid climates, we do not want any interior vapor retarders, let alone vapor barriers, as the walls must be allowed to dry inwards. Vapor diffusion acts on a gradient from warm to cold and from high concentrations to low concentrations. If there hadn't been any vinyl wallpaper, and if the building had not been air conditioned, there likely wouldn't have been many problems. But the interior vapor barrier was the icing on the cake. So what's the solution? You probably guessed it. Close off all of the vents and air seal all of the penetrations. Air sealing all of the penetrations and the vents will enclose the walls, the floor, and the roof assemblies within the conditioned space. Outside air stays outside, and the inside air stays inside. This is called environmental separation, and it's a cornerstone of building science and envelope or enclosure design. But won't moisture stagnate if we don't have fresh air? We'll get to that in a little bit. To seal the existing vents, we called for covering the backside of the vent with a thin piece of stainless sheet metal that was set in a bead of sealant and fastened to the concrete wall. For good measure, we also called for spraying the backside of the concrete walls with a liquid applied membrane that's a vapor variable and can resist an enormous amount of hydrostatic pressure. This not only provides a final air seal, but it also helps to slow down any inwardly driven vapor from moisture that was absorbed by the concrete wall so that it doesn't inundate the backside of the interior finishes. When the sun hits the surface of a material that absorbs and stores water, some moisture evaporates at the surface, but much of that moisture is actually driven inwards since moisture moves from the warm side of the wall to the cold side, and so we aren't taking any chances this time around. We also called for replacing all of the paper face drywall with an inorganic glass mat gypsum product. This eliminates the potential food source for mold if moisture does happen to condense on the backside of the drywall, as the paper facers on standard sheets of drywall make a great, easily digestible food source for mold. We also called for only using vapor permeable paints and wallpapers such as those made from natural plant fibers, the same stuff that the older buildings used. No vinyl wallpaper, no foil or metal, and no oil-based or epoxy paint. Now for the ventilation side of things. We want controlled mechanical ventilation that allows us to bring in outside air at a measured and controlled rate that's dehumidified to avoid raising interior relative humidity levels. We might have eliminated the passive vents, but overventilation for mechanical systems is also a big problem that the U.S. is currently facing. More ventilation is not necessarily a good thing, and so we need to be smart about how we address this problem. It can also be beneficial to operate at a slight positive pressure in warm, humid climates to push out any humid air that could leak inside through any unforeseen locations, like a leaky window or a door threshold, so that we're never sucking air inside from uncontrolled locations. This problem isn't unique to Japan, and it provides a good case study into why passive ventilation and unrestricted air leakage can be a big problem, especially in hot, humid climates. Clear environmental separation between the interior conditioned space and the exterior environment is critical to the long-term durability of the building, and to avoid these nightmarish mold remediations. I want to thank our client for allowing us to share this project. We hope that this can save many people a lot of future headaches and health problems with mold toxicity, not to mention the expensive remediation costs. If you found this video helpful, make sure to leave a like and subscribe for more weekly building science videos. And head over to our website at asiri-designs.com where we have over 150 free building science articles that cover a wide range of topics. Links will be in the description below. For now, good luck with your projects. Cheers.